Father, thank you for this time. Thank you uh, that we have an opportunity to gather and uh, see what your word has to say um, from the book of Job. Over the past few weeks, we've been going through this series, and uh, God, it just seems like it is a timely series uh, for many of us in the room to be able to hear these words and uh, just to soak up what wisdom and um, what you would have to say to us even during this season, a book that was written thousands of years ago to have such uh, wisdom and help for us. I pray that our, our hearts and our minds will be open to this and uh, that you would be honored by our time. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So this past week, um, my daughter Iris learned a new thing on the piano. So she takes piano lessons, and she's a couple years in now. She learned something called dissonance, okay? It happens when you play two or more notes together that don't exactly sound like they should go together. They do, it doesn't sound whole or complete. Sometimes it can sound downright ugly and uh, clashy. Uh, they create this tension inside of you to uh, resolve it, to find resolution, to find completion. Uh, some people might even say they're not even fun to play. Uh, they're definitely not fun to listen to on their own. And in fact, when I was teaching Iris about these dissonant chords, we were playing a Christmas piece that she's preparing. Uh, she played the notes together and just started yelling at me, Daddy, this is not right. That is not the right chord. Uh, these sound ugly. There may have been tears, and uh, they have, may have been mine. They may have been hers. I'm not going to uh, clarify that. But I, I'm not exaggerating. She was nailing it right there. These are not supposed to play together. These are not supposed to sound. Music doesn't sound like that. It can't be ugly. And I just said, Iris, please, just trust me. I promise you're playing the right notes that are on the page. I don't know why the person wrote it that way. Uh, but I promise you're doing it right. Just wait until the whole song gets put together. In life, we have dissonance. These are the times when the categories of our worldview begin to clash. They don't make sense. They sound off. They can sound ugly. And it can actually seem like those dissonant chords in our life are being played way too often and way too loudly. It's usually around categories like this, when we see known wicked people prospering, righteous people suffering, death coming early for the humble, while the abusive man lives long. When you make all the right decisions, like you're tr trying to do the right thing, and your plan just crumbles and fails. When you see, no matter what your political persuasion, we just came out of an election, you see wicked people running the government. How is that supposed to work? The lazy person in school gets the A's when you work your tail off and you can't even get a C. You work hard in your job. You treat people with kindness. And your boss gives the job to somebody else who belittles you, belittles others, maybe slacks off. Liars are the ones with influence and people who tell the truth get mocked. We could go on. Question is, how do we handle those dissonant moments or perhaps even seasons? Well, we've been going through the book of Job, and today we are actually going to get to the climax of the story. And I think we're going to be handling that very question. But before we get into it, I want to remind ourselves of two very important details that come from the very beginning of the story that are going to help us understand the context of what we're going to be actually reading. Number one, there is a heavenly throne room scene that Job and his friends have no clue about. Only the reader knows about it. It's like this special knowledge that we have. You see, Job and his friends can only see what's going on in the physical, earthly realm. The second thing is this. In the very first verse, we learn about Job that he is blameless and upright. In the Hebrew Bible, there are two people with those words next to them. One is Noah. He was blameless and upright among all in his generation. And one more, Abraham, 
God tells him, because he wasn't exactly walking blamelessly and uprightly before God, God tells him, walk before me, blameless and upright. So Job is presented in this story as a non-Hebrew version of Abraham, but unlike Abraham, this guy is actually blameless and upright. Jeremy's already mentioned this before. The point, uh, our goal at least in this series, is not to determine if Job was like a historical real human being. That's not the point here. The, the, the writer of, the, of Job and the way that they put this in the collection of the Hebrew scriptures is it's in the writings section as a story of wisdom. Today, we're going to read a little bit more about who Job was that's going to clue us into the fact that at least if he was a real historical figure, the writer is going to exaggerate his righteousness on purpose to create an even more hyperbolic dissonance. So from chapter 3 all the way until today, we've watched a cycle happen between Job and his friends. Job starts by lamenting, and then, in the form of poetry, each friend speaks, then Job responds, then another friend speaks, then Job responds, and then another friend speaks, and then Job responds, and we do this a couple times. And today we're going to hear the last of Bildad. You're like, finally, no more friends. Well, gotcha. There is one more friend that shows up out of nowhere after this part of the story, but we're going to hear the last words of Bildad, a reply from Job, and then also his final plea in case before God. But nestled in all of this is a brilliant, brilliant poem that most think is actually from the author. It's not the words of Job or any of his friends. And it is kind of like a key that is supposed to unlock the main point of the story. So, uh, Let's walk through the text. It's going to be a high view because of how much text we actually have to cover, but hopefully we can gain something about what God wants us to do with the dissonance that we experience. So in Job 25, we're going to start there. We have the shortest speech of Job's friends, finally. Okay, it's almost like as one of those conversations that you might have with your friends or in your family where you go on for hours and hours and hours. You're just arguing back and forth. I believe what I believe. You believe what you believe. And I am tired of talking. Like we haven't gotten anywhere. Nobody's happy. We actually might be worse off that everybody has spoken. Well, Bildad, his last words to Job is like six verses. And Here's what he says. He's talking about how God is this awesome ruler and creator. And he's so perfect and so much higher than anything else that it all pales in comparison to him. So therefore, if everything else pales in comparison to to God, here is man. How much less man who is a maggot. What a word. And the son of man who is a worm. Job. You and I, were worthless, okay? That's the point of the story here. You and I are worthless. This is in addition to his other awesome friend, Eliphaz, who just told him a couple weeks, or last week that we covered this maybe, you are way more wicked than you think. And the reason why I know this is because you're suffering worse than anybody I've ever seen. Therefore, you have to be worse than anybody I've ever seen. What great friends. You're a horrible person and you're worthless. So Job responds to his so-called friends here with some pretty heavy sarcasm starting in verse 1 in chapter 26. He says this, Oh, how you have helped him who has no power, how you have saved the arm that has no strength. In other words, uh, Job's like, dude, if you and I are so worthless, how, how do you have the power to be able to strengthen somebody with your wisdom? If God is the wise and awesome one, where in the world did you find this? Like, we don't even compare to him. We're worthless. How can you have something so valuable? Then we come to this fascinating section, beginning in verse 5, and it goes through the end of chapter 27. And these words focus on three things. The first is this. It focuses on the great power of God. In other words, it affirms something that Bildad was saying. 
For, for example, in verses 12 to 14, it says, By his power he stilled the sea. By his understanding he shattered Rahab. By his wind the heavens were made fair. His hand pierced the fleeing serpent. as some real power. Behold, these are but the outskirts of his ways. In other words, like we're not even scratching the surface. And how small a whisper do we hear of him? But the thunder of his power? Who can understand? Now, there's a lot of amazing stuff happening in verses 12 to 13. We do not have time to get into it, but if you want to talk about serpents and, you know, dragons and all that, just talk to me after the service. I love it. But the point of this section is the great power of God. Then we come to the second piece of doctrine. This is in chapters 27, and this is a commitment to piety. A commitment to piety. So in verse 1, it says this, As God lives, who has taken away my right, and the Almighty, who has made my soul bitter, as long as my breath is in me and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils, my lips will not speak falsehood and my tongue will not utter deceit. The one saying these words is committed to piety, committed to integrity. And then later on, we have the third doctrine. Verses 13 to 15. This is the portion of the wicked man with God and the heritage that oppressors receive from the Almighty. If his children are multiplied, it is for the sword. That's no good. And his descendants have not enough bread. That's no good. Those who survive him, the pestilence buries. That's no good. And his widows do not weep. In other words, the wicked man does not prosper. We need to notice something here. Many scholars are actually confused about who actually is saying these words. Because the way it's written in our text is, this is Job speaking. Many scholars are like, no, this doesn't fit Job's posture. This doesn't fit the narrative of Job. Because up to this point, he's lamented his suffering and stood up for his piety. But now we have this abrupt declaration of the greatness and power of God and the declaration of his remaining Uh, in piety, and his belief in agreement that God judges the wicked. So, could these actually be Job's words? And if that's true, how? What I would suggest is, obviously I can't say for sure one way or the other, but I believe that they are Job's words. And it's not just me. There's good reason to attribute these words to Job. For example, here's what Dr. Dwayne Garrett says of this very point. He says, we need to go back to a starting point. You see, Job is not different from his three friends in his basic theology. They believe God is great. Job believes God is great. They believe God punishes the wicked. Job believes God punishes the wicked. They believe God repays the righteous. And Job also believes the same thing. Job is not really that different here. And when he makes this great confession of faith, he's speaking of uh, Job 26 and 27, he's holding to the traditional wisdom, and that is still part of his problem, what he's wrestling with. He cannot reconcile it with his condition. He doesn't know how to bring the two, what I would say is three, we're talking about three, together. If Job did not hold to their theology, he wouldn't have a problem, right? You see, if if Job believed that God was not all-powerful, or if Job believed God did not judge the wicked, then he would just look at his condition and say, that, well, that's just what happens. That's how life is. Job is wrestling with these three doctrines, God's greatness, his judgment of the wicked, and a commitment to faithfulness and integrity and and piety. But when you play those three notes with suffering, you end up with this chord of dissonance in life that longs for resolution, for wholeness. So what does Job do? Well, here's what he does. We're skipping to chapter 29. I'll come back to 28. That's actually the poem that we'll focus on. Job, from chapters 29 to 31, has his last long speech. In fact, I think that he believes that he's going to die after this speech. It's structured like this. He begins with verses remembering of how good things used to be when he had a beautiful relationship with God, when the community respected him, when he had his family with him, and when he was prospering. That's natural. That's not a bad thing. When you are suffering, it is actually good 
to go back and look at, oh man, think of all the good times that I did enjoy when God was blessing me. He begins his speech like this. In verse 2, he says, Oh, that I were as in the months of old, as in the days when God watched over me, when his lamp shone upon my head, and by his light I walked through darkness. As I was in my prime, when the friendship of God was upon my tent, when the Almighty was yet with me, his relationship with God, when my children were all around me, when my steps were washed with butter and the rock poured out for me streams of oil. Then in chapter 30, he switches gears and take notice, this man did nothing wrong, yet look at how others in the community viewed him. Chapter 30, verse 2, now they laugh at me. And now I have become their song. I'm a byword to them. They abhor me. They keep aloof from me. They do not hesitate to spit at the sight of me. This man's character was not the determining factor for whether people in his community respected him. It was his wealth. It was how easy and blessed his life was. Then we come to the words that Job believes to be his last. The reason I say this is not necessarily because he actually says, oh, these are my last words, I'm going to die, but actually because of the kind of discourse that it is. He's giving what is called a negative confession. These were ancient speeches that people would give as last words before they go into the presence of their gods. Some of you maybe perhaps have heard of the Book of the Dead, which is this Egyptian document written around 1550 BC that's full of incantations and spells that are supposed to help people as they go into the afterlife or the underworld. And you say, okay, nerd, what does this have to do with anything that we're talking about? Well, one of the parts of this book was the negative confession that a soul would give before they go into the presence of the deity, pleading for mercy, pleading for justice. Job is employing that same kind of rhetoric with Yahweh right here. He's sharing how he believes, I have been Righteous, I've not done any of these things. How is God going to judge him from this? So, how do we make sense of all of that? You see, up to this point, God has been silent as the dissonant chord of righteous suffering continues to be played on the keyboard. Yet Job never recants his integrity. He never admits to any of the evil that he did not commit. He never curses God. He never says God is not powerful. He never even declares God is unjust. To put it in musical terms, instead, he plays this dissonant chord as loud as he possibly can, declaring to God that it just needs resolution. He doesn't have it. You ever felt that before? I remember four years ago when we had just moved to New Jersey, Um, from Indiana. I was pastoring there. My family was doing a lot of ministry in a neighborhood that was filled with families moving out of Chicago, looking for a better life, moving away from crime, trying to find cheaper housing, better education. And uh, during those four years of ministry, I had become very close with two families. Uh, Their family had been in our home. Our family had uh, enjoyed parties together in their homes. Uh, I had gotten the chance to baptize four of Uh, their children. But when I lost my job, when I got fired from that job, those families became extremely skeptical of the church and what was going on. And within one year of us moving to New Jersey, one of the moms had been shot in the head by her boyfriend in front of the five kids. Another family, one of their teenagers, who had been getting involved in our Bible studies and going to uh, church with us, getting involved in the community, ended up getting involved in gang, in a gang, and he was shot and killed. All within one year. And when I tell you dissonance was happening in my own heart, it was pounding so loud. I wrestled with guilt. I was like, did I do something wrong to get fired? I didn't know of anything that I had done wrong. Then I was also asking, how could this happen? 
And I'm sure there was something we call savior complex going on inside of me too. But I tell you, there was genuine confusion of notes being played that should not have been played together. I was so distraught. And I bet you, many of you have asked the same question, why God? Why? And you're just pounding that dissonant chord up to the heavens, hoping that he would hear. What's the answer to that? That's where chapter 28 comes in. You see, tucked into the discourse of these friends, what seems most likely is that the author of the book has written or placed a piece of wisdom right into the middle of the story, whispering, this is the point right here. This is the point. And I encourage you, read it on your own time. Okay, Job chapter 28, it is golden. But for sake of time, I I have to summarize it. You see, up to this point, we've been playing that dissonant chord, righteous suffering. Is God's justice actually working? Remember, it was a Satan who came to God in the original, uh, in the beginning of the story saying, you are not really just. The, The way that you run things in the world, that's not really going to work. Well, in this poem, the author is searching for wisdom. Wisdom in how to put all of those pieces together. But it's not any kind of wisdom. You see, Dr. Garrett, who I just referenced earlier, he talks about this passage um, as being, as referencing uh, one kind of wisdom, but there's three kinds. The first kind is like the simple level wisdom, like learning how to uh, bake or cook or being organized or uh, cleaning your room. Like these are skills and it takes wisdom and, able, and discipline to be able to do those things, but they are very obvious to find. You can learn how to do it pretty easily. Then there's a second level wisdom. This is the wisdom of Proverbs. Uh, Pro- the wisdom of Proverbs is not hiding from everyone. The wisdom of Proverbs is out in the street saying, listen, you simple man, I can make you wise. It's It's the kind of wisdom that's built into the fabric of creation. So when we live inside of it, we experience blessing. When you live outside of it, you naturally will be able to see the consequences of that. For example, if you look at monogamous, faithful relationships, okay, that is wisdom built into creation. When you are able to live inside of that, you see blessing happen for everyone involved. But when you see those relationships broken for whatever reason, even if it's a righteous person being left or two unrighteous people breaking up, there are consequences to that. And you can just look at data. Like it is built into the fabric of creation. We were built for that. Then there's level three wisdom. And that is what we're talking about here. Here's how the author talks about it. He says, humans... Yeah, you can do amazing things. We can. We can dig and we can find so many precious gems. But you know what we can't find? We can't find this wisdom. Animals can't find it. Man can turn mountains upside down. They can go into the waters. Can't find it. Verse 12 says this. Where can wisdom be found? Where is the place of understanding? Man doesn't even know how much it's worth. It can't be bought. It's priceless. It's hidden from everyone and everything. Hades and death, they don't even know it. They've heard of it. And then you get to verse 23, and here's what it says. God understands the way to it, and he knows its place. Let that just sit with us for a second. This third level wisdom, we do not know it. We just don't. It's not something that we can just find in the fabric of creation. We ask so many times, and we turn up the dissonant chord as loud as we can, just praying for God to hear us. We say, why did you have to take my friend? Why did I have to go through my parents divorcing? Why did I have to be abused? Why did you take my mom so early? Why am I the one with this body? Why does my kid have to suffer? We just pound away at that cord as loud as we can. And you know what? 
God wants to hear it. He does. He wants to hear that question. He wants you to yell it out at him. Job does it over and over. But do not stop there. Because here's God's answer. And I pray that this might bring peace and comfort to every single one of us. Verse 28 says this. Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to turn away from evil is understanding. Verse 28 again. Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to turn away from evil is understanding. You want to see the results of third level wisdom one day? This is our path. God knows the way to it. And we never see it until we've been walking in that path. And we don't know when he's going to show us the answer to that question. There's always more going on in the story than we even know. Here's what the author is telling you, telling me. We've got to trust the wisdom of the composer of the Song of the Cosmos. You gotta trust the wisdom of the composer of the Song of the Cosmos. Life is a symphony. There's gonna be pieces, sections of that song filled with joy, filled with abundance, and then there's gonna be times when the dissonant chord comes out and it just rings out over and over and over. And when it does, you and I, we will become anxious to resolve it. We will want to resolve it so badly. And what God is saying is as much time as you spend trying to figure out how to resolve that chord, he wants you to step back, invites you to step back and just say, I'm trusting the composer. He's the one who wrote this song. Right now, all I can see is the dissonance. You see, that's exactly what the Satan was after in the beginning of the story. Would Job focus on the dissonance and lose hope in its composer, or would he remain faithful to the composer even in the darkest part of his symphony? You say, okay, let's play this out. I want to try to do this. What, what happens? Well, there's two practical things that happen when you start to trust the heart of the composer. First, your doctrine can submit to God's character. Sounds a little sketch. Your doctrine can submit to God's character. Here, here's the thing. Doctrine is super important, but you know what doctrine is? It is my ideas of how I view God's work in the world. God's character is how he reveals himself. So what I'm saying is, let what you think you see about God's work in the world be trumped by the way he reveals himself. There was one main difference between Job and his friends, and it was not their theology. They all believed that God was holy and awesome. They all believed that God judged the wicked. They all believed that he was good, and they all believed that we should be righteous. What's the difference? Job was willing to trust the character of God over his own categories of how he thought the world should work. Therefore, he was able to see the limitations of his own worldviews. And that can only happen when you submit and trust the heart of the composer's character. Truth is, we're a little bit more like Job's friends than we think. How many times have you heard or maybe even uttered the statement, we just came out of an election, how can a Christian vote for him or vote for her? How do you talk about people or two people who are going through divorce? How do you talk about the churches that do things differently than the way we do them? How do we talk about people in the communities that are less affluent than the ones we live in? Do we just use them as pawns in our agendas, our political agendas? Do we, like Job's friends, look at the suffering in those communities and just automatically say, well, they must have done X, Y, or Z. Or if they just did X, Y, or Z, things would be a little bit better. You say, well, that doesn't really have anything to do with suffering. And I say, actually, it, it has everything to do with suffering because suffering will hit you. It will hit your neighbor when we least expect it. And if we do not constantly remind ourselves to focus on the character of God, then we will easily let our doctrine and worldviews go unchecked and we will end up like Job's friends. And we're going to judge the community around us. 
So may we be a people that cultivates the posture of trusting the character of God. Number two, you get to watch empathy and compassion grow in your own life. Throughout the book of Job, we've learned that he had the same view of the world that his friends did. If you do good, you should receive good, and vice versa. And before his suffering, how do you think he may have viewed the poor widow or the homeless man? I bet he probably did the right thing. He gave. But it was probably because he was a generous human being, but now that he's suffering, he's able to do, he's, he has a shift in his worldview of humans. He becomes numbered with the outcasts. He feels what they have felt. He experiences the mockery, the ostracization, the poverty, the pain. His view of humanity is way different. What if every time we had that dissonant chord in our lives, we memorialized it by how we were feeling in that moment, not so that we can complain, but so that when the person next to us is experiencing that dissonance, we go back to, here is what I was feeling. I know that feeling. Let me just sit with you. Some of you know this about my wife, Kara. She grew up in an extremely difficult home. Parents divorced, lots of gossip, some physical abuse, lots of neglect. As a kid... How are you supposed to process all of that? She didn't deserve that, but for some reason, unbeknownst to her, she was there. She experienced the horrors, the backstabbing, the the splitting up. And sometimes we still talk about that in our own relationship. Kara could have become embittered to God. Instead, around the age of 16, she began trusting the composer of her song. And you know what I've seen in her? We've been a part of small groups with all kinds of people from all kinds of backgrounds that have been going through the ringer, and there is no one like Kara who can sit with someone who's been abused, who's been rejected, who's been forgotten by everyone else, and she doesn't even have to wait for them to come. She can find them. There's no one that I'd rather be sitting with me in the dust and ashes compassion, empathy. Why? Because when you trust the heart of the composer, you don't immediately go to judging somebody for their circumstances, for their suffering. You see their humanity first. You feel the longing for peace, for wholeness, when they didn't do anything to break it in the first place. And I know some of you in here, you have that same kind of story, and now you have that gift because you're trusting the heart of the composer. And keep at it because it's forming the very heart of God inside of you. Now, those are just two practical things that happen when you do trust him. But what reason do we have to? Why should we trust him? Well, I shared what kind of life we've been going through this. What kind of life Job received as he was suffering. He became the laughing stock. People were spitting at him. And I know that we're not at the end of Job, so I'm not going to spoil the ending. But whether or not Job was a Uh, a real historical figure or not, there is one like Job who was, who really did suffer righteously, and he trusted the heart of the composer. Even when the dissonant chord was louder than it's ever been in the history of humankind, Jesus uttered on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was on a cross that he didn't deserve. Just like Job was spat on, the soldiers spat on Jesus. Just like the community wagged their heads at Job on their way into the community, Jews would wag their heads at Jesus on the cross on their way in and out of the city. The Roman soldiers wagging their heads at Jesus. Just like Job's friends betrayed him and condemned him, Jesus' disciples ran from him. One of them even betrayed him in his greatest turmoil. But unlike Job, Job does not die in the story. Jesus, the righteous sufferer, did. The whole story of human history pauses for three days on that dissonant chord of hopelessness. But then on that third day, it's like God gave us the the chord of resolution, just a hint that would be the hope throughout the rest of the song when he raised Jesus on that day and opened up the door, opened up the gates for you and me to truly trust the composer because just as the apostle Paul says, for if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall surely be united with him in a resurrection like his. 
that righteous sufferer became the savior of the world. We're going to pause here just for a moment. And uh, go before God. And uh, listen to him. What is he trying to say? What is he inviting you into? Maybe you've lost sight of the heart of the composer and you've been focusing on the dissonance in your life. Maybe you've never admitted that you can't figure out this wisdom and you would like to listen to the heart of God. Whatever it is, just listen and I'll uh, close in prayer. Dear God, we are a a people who I know in this community are experiencing dissonance. And there's some in here who are about ready to hear that note played in their lives. There's some in here who have just heard that note played. Uh, and And you invite us into a place of vulnerability where we say we don't know that third level wisdom. And we trust that you do. So we're just gonna trust your heart and we're going to continue to uh, play, those, play the song that you've written. God, I pray that you would help us to be a people who, in the moments of dissonance, would uh, trust your character, trust your wisdom, um, and that we would be looking to be a people of compassion, of empathy, that we would let our worldviews be trumped by your character. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.